guys to get an opportunity to present on my work. Um, I spent the summer in Afghanistan this past summer um, interviewing educators, uh, uh, teachers who spent 30, 40 years of their life teaching in time of conflict. Um, in this presentation, I will talk about, uh, I'll focus on three points. I will um, talk about how I got introduced to oral history and why I chose oral history as my method. And, um, and the second point is why I think oral history is um, important and it can play a significant role in preserving the histories of societies that are, that are trying to emerge out of conflict. Um, and I will focus on the example of Afghanistan to try to explain that significance that I see in oral history. Um, and lastly, I'll show uh, a few clips of uh, my interviews that I did over summer, and we will have a discussion about some specific um, elements and, and, and some observations that I have about the clips of about, about memory and how and how you know certain narratives are constructed in the memory and how these individuals that I've I, I've, I've picked these clips uh, purposefully because I, I, they really tell about how they construct these 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 you know memories. Um, so why did I choose oral history as my method? It's it's interesting because usually when people decide to do research, they 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 they, they decide on a field or a subject, and then they, you know, choose a method, and then they go reach out to subjects. Uh, for me, it was completely the other way around. I knew my subjects way before I knew about oral history. Um, I will I'll explain how this happened. Um, I came to the U.S. seven years ago as a, as a freshman in high school um, on a scholarship with, with the help of an organization called Seeds of Peace. And I left, the school that I left behind in Afghanistan was in absolutely horrible shape. Um, it, was, it was notorious for, 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 for the amount of violence that happened at the school, for the number of times a week people got stabbed, um, and, or the number of times that teachers were wrestled down by students in the classroom, or, or physically too, the school was in absolutely, you know, awful shape. Um, there were no windows, no, no, no furniture, no, um, uh, and it was the school. The school that I went to is 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 in the middle of a bazaar, um, and it it didn't have any walls that that enclosed it from from its surroundings. And what would happen in the afternoons would be that shopkeepers from, from the local bazaar would make their way to the school after they've had a nice lunch and they'll find a corner on campus just take their afternoon dump. It was, it was, it was just absolutely open. The campus was absolutely open with no, no sense of, you know, a school campus because it didn't have any walls. It, was, it wasn't a close, closed off. So this is the school that I left behind in 2003 when I came to the U.S. And I mean, if I if I give you the image without telling you that it was a school, you would think it's it's you know it's an abandoned building. It's 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 some sort of ruins. Uh, the only the only thing that marks it as a school is because some some you know transmission of knowledge happened during the day uh, because about you know thirty to forty percent of teachers on a lucky day would show up. So this is two thousand and three. Um, I come to the U.S. in two thousand and three and I start school here. Uh, but I go back every year to Afghanistan um, in subsequent years, <coughs> and every time that I went back to Afghanistan, I was incredibly surprised and impressed by, by the amount of progress that was made at the school. Between 2003 and 2005, 2006, the school completely transformed from, from, from the ruins that it was into a very vibrant, very beautiful, very green, um, you know, campus where there was discipline, there was order, there was actually, you know, learning and teaching happening. And I, I got involved in this school too. I, you know, I did some community service projects and, and I got a chance to closely observe what was happening at this school. And I was curious to, to see why the progress or how the progress was so rapid. I mean, there was progress happening in general in the country because there was a lot of money flowing in and there's a lot of international attention. Uh, since 2001, but the pace at which the progress was happening at the school was, you know, incredible to me. Um, so, I, I, you know, I looked closer, and and what I found was that most of the progress that had happened was because of 
the innovative leadership style that the principal of the school had. It was most of, pretty much everything that had happened was due to his style of leadership and how he could use the resources that he had, which weren't much at all, to, to you know, to, to build, to rebuild a school. Um, we, will see, we will see a clip of the principal talking about his experience um, in a few minutes. But this guy was absolutely incredible. He, this is a school of 10,000 students. 10,000 students, a public school, it has only a couple buildings, and it runs in four shifts a day. It starts at 6.30, say first shift goes from 6.30 to 10, then the second shift a student come in from 10 to 2, and then four shifts a day, and the last shift ends at 7.30 in the evening. This principal would come in 6.30 in the morning and be at school till 7.30. Around 10,000 students who were, you know, who, who were notorious for being rogues and and, 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 you know, violent. But the, the school was absolutely known for how violent it was in, 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 in Kabul. Um, but this guy changed the school within two or three years into one of the top institutions in Kabul, both in the sense that it produced, it, it graduated really smart students and well-trained students, but also because it had a, it had a very conducive environment uh, for learning. So I... I took a closer look at him and I observed how he went about his his leadership and 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 to show you uh, the the innovative style of his leadership I'll share an example of of of, of something that he did that um, I think I've shared with you um, this guy put together a disciplinary system that was absolutely fascinating to me um, in the traditional way a student would be disciplined by you know getting beaten in their in the palms of their hands with a stick or even in the soles of their feet if they, if they did something wrong. Or if you're lucky, you could get away with just, you know, getting a quick slap in your face because it's, it, you get a sensation when you get slapped, but it doesn't last that long. But if you get hit and be, beaten with a stick, it lasts longer than, than, the, than the pain that you feel from a slap. So this is the traditional method of how, you know, discipline and punishment happen in schools. But this guy changed that. Um, what he did was he put a penal system, like a fine system in place, where if a student did something wrong, say if a student had five absences in a month, he wouldn't get beaten five times in the palm of his hand, but he would be fined to bring five bushes and plant them in the school. <laughs> or he would be, he would be, he would be fined to do, to pump five hours of water and, you know, water the, this rejuvenated garden of his school. Or, or, or he would have to, you know, shovel the dirt for five hours uh, because, as I told you, the school was completely, you know, it was a ruins, there was nothing growing there before. Um, so in the, the soil needed preparation for things to grow again. So the student would be, you know, the punishment would be to have the student out there in the sun shoveling the dirt for five hours. Or, or the worst, uh, there, was a, there was a hierarchy of punishment, and the worst was... Um, our, our, our main, the traditional way of fertilizing the land still is, you know, human uh, manure. Um, so the worst was that the student would get to bring some manure to a campus to fertilize, you know, the, the garden. So this is, it's, it's very innovative in, in, in a sense that... <laughs> <laughs> I should think of some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a sense that he's he solved multiple problems with this with this you know this 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 style of uh, punishment and discipline. Um, in the short term, he took care of you know the greenery and the garden uh, because he didn't have any resources you know to to hire gardeners or the people to do the work. So you own resources, the student body, you use it. Um, and it was a long term solution too. If you put the student to work <coughs> into creating the garden it's more likely that he won't destroy it. He'll protect it. So it's, uh, for me, things, little things like this that he did were absolutely fascinating. Um, so having observed these things, I came back to Columbia with a mission that, uh, that I wanted to bring this guy to the U.S., say, for, for a month-long month, month -long tour uh, to give him a chance to see, you know, high schools as well as colleges because he's never been abroad. But if, but if you see how innovative he gets and how, manipulate, how he manipulates the little resource that he has, um, I, thought, I thought a trip abroad for him would, would do too good. 
Uh, first, that, that he would get to see, you know, other systems of education and how people go about um, teaching and organizing and leading schools. And secondly, because I thought he had an incredible story to share and, 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 and to, f to, to people here, to share with people here, that, uh, that, that how, how do people go about, about managing or leading a school in such difficult times? They have to get creative. So uh, this was my mission. I came back to Columbia. I was trying to get this guy over here. Um, I worked on it over a year. It just financially just, it just wasn't possible. Um, I spoke to people, you know, apply for grants and everything, but it didn't work out. I needed about $5,000 for it. Um, I, I didn't give up on spreading the word about him, but, uh, but I had to, you know, give up the idea of bringing him here. Um, so I wrote about him to, you know, certain papers and stuff like that. Um, it was about that time that, um, that, that, that I was trying to look into other ways of spreading the word about him that, that I attended a lecture by Mary Marshall um, about oral history. Uh, you give a presentation at CUSP. Um, and as she talked about, you know, the power of the method and, um, and, and, and how it... And I realized how it could be an immediate solution to what I was trying to do, uh, to, to, to spread his story, to get his story out, but also a long-term solution to make sure that his story is recorded and his story remains um, to people who are interested in, in, in the education, in the history of education, uh, but just to, to people down the line who will be curious about how, peop how, how these guys went about leading the schools under such difficult circumstances. So when I listened to a lecture by Mary Marshall, I realized that oral history could be useful to me as a method. Uh, and when I, say, when I say that my subjects found my research method, method this is what I mean, that, that I had my subjects in mind first before I decided on oral history. Um, so, so far, I've talked about, you know, hi oral, about oral history in the sense that it, it helped fulfill my immediate need of, of getting this story out. Um, but what does this have to do with, with, with the notion of archive and, 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 and when I say that oral history is important to post-conflict societies, how's, how's, how are those things related? Um, about the same time that I decided on oral history as my method, um, I ran across a, I came across a article on BBC um, about and, and, and the article confirmed some fears and doubts that I had about, um, about history in Afghanistan. Um, first of all, the article, uh, the article was about the history of, about history textbooks in the Afghan curriculum, like the current textbooks that are used to teach students history in Afghanistan. Um, the first thing the article focused was on was uh, pretty fascinating to me. It, it showed how biased the language is in, and how there is a lot of political um, propaganda and, 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 and um, political purpose behind the way the books are written. Um, as an example, uh, to, 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 to show you what I mean by this, uh, uh, the, b the article gave a quote from one of the history textbook, textbooks in Afghanistan on the issue of Kashmir. This is international history to us. So the history of Kashmir, the idiom, the, 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 the language it's described in is, is this. It says, the land grabbing and greedy Prime Minister of India would not give up Kashmir to our Muslim and brother friends, Pakistan, who, have, who are the rightful owners of the land. And I, I, I can testify to, to this language because I use a similar textbook. This is the language that, you know, a history textbook is written in, that, 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 that our students get trained with. This was the first thing that the BBC article focused on. The second and the more important point was that it, it had a quote from the Minister of Education on, on the writing of local history. The Minister of Education said that it would take Afghanistan another 30 to 40 years at least before a factual history of the violence that happened the past 40 years could be written. This is, this is you know, the official stand. The Minister of Education saying that it will take at least three to four decades before a fact before the time is right for factual history to be written, um, and 
why is that? I want to I explain this point a little and, and it will show the importance of what I mean, uh, why I think oral history ha can play a significant role in um, conflict areas. So why can't the history of the past 30, 40 years of Afghanistan not be written right away? Well, it's a history of absolute devastation and brutality of civil war. 30 years, I mean, at least 20 years of that was just, just brutality, just, just bloodshed, um, people dying. In, in, in those 20 years, 6 million people left the country. This is, this is a quarter of the population. 6 million people. It, it's, it's a number that even the tragedies of Rwanda and Darfur can, can match. Um, and, and all this happened because there was a power vacuum left. When the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan and the communist regime fell, there was a power vacuum left. And political parties started fighting over power. Um, a civil war broke out, and in this civil war, the civil war lasted for about 10 to 15 years. Thousands and thousands of people died, and 6 million people left the country. So if this is the history of the past 30 years of Afghanistan, the history of suffering because of civil war, now the history can't be written because those elements who caused the suffering are still prominent in the society. The people who caused the bloodshed, the people who took, you know, took away a lot of lives are still very prominent in the society. When, when, when a society comes out of conflict, it, it doesn't, it, when, when there's relative peace, it doesn't mean all is well. It doesn't mean, you know, there's freedom to write whatever you want, however you want. Because those elements who cause the suffering will be around for another until they fade out. So the history, a factual history of Afghanistan cannot be written for this reason. That these people who fought over power, who, who, you know, who caused all the suffering are still pretty much controlling the country in one way or another, directly or indirectly. They will not let, you know, anyone who spends the idea of a factual history, you know, get to, get to their goal. They will, they will get in the way. So this is, this is one of the reasons why I think oral history is important. Um, if, and, and I'll get to that. If, and, and, and also, if, if you have such turbulence over f of 30 years, where 6 million people just, just leave the country, and I can give you an image of what Kabul looked like during these 10 years. People just left behind furnished houses because all they could do was, you know, protect their family and, and <coughs> leave the country with their family. They didn't care about their belongings. Kabul was like a ghost town, just, just painted with blood all over for about six or seven years. If, if you've got such turbulence where people, the only thing people care about is their lives and trying to save their, their loved ones, you can't hope for much of an archive to remain and to be preserved and protected. So for 30 years, all people cared about was their lives, about trying to get their family food, trying to get peace, try to, try to find a safe shelter. You can't, you can't expect an archive. Either, either the archives, the government archives that we had, got caught in the crossfire and, you know, got burned that way, or, or, or got systematically destroyed by, by political parties who saw the archive as, as, you know, against what they were trying to do. So if you're, if you're coming out of such a history of 30 years where the archive pretty much doesn't exist, but the history cannot be written for another 30 years because the elements who caused the suffering of the lives and also the archive are still prominent in the society. If, if, if you come out of such a, such a, such a situation, the risk you run is, is, is losing a lot of stories, losing a lot of historical knowledge until the time is right for it to be written down. So now there's relative peace. But the history cannot be written for another 30 years. This transitional period, the generation who suffered during the Civil War, they will, they will, they will die. They will, they will pass their time. But their history cannot be written for another 30 years. So we, it, it's a huge risk of losing all those stories. And if the history of 30 years is pretty much the history of the suffering of a people, we need to make sure that those stories are archived and recorded 
for when the time is right to, for it to be incorporated into history. That's, that's where I think oral history can play an absolutely cru crucial role. That, um, that it, 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 it's, it's a method that could meet our immediate needs of, 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 of preserving these stories. Um, and preserving these stories in a way that, that uh, the power of oral history for me is the fact that the individual who's telling the story has complete control over it. You know, if, if, if somebody else, if, 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 if you think of the conventional sense of history, it's the author who spins the evidence any way he or she wants. But in oral history, it's the individual telling the story Com has complete control over it. The only, th I mean, the only, the only, the closest thing that the role of the interviewee comes to is 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 a role of a collaborator, you know, of, of of generating questions to make sure you get a complete story to try to get as much detail as possible. So if not only not only is is oral history in the set helpful in the sense that we'll be we'll be recording these stories and and preserving historical information. But, but we'll also be honoring the suffering of the people in the past 30 years by giving them the agency over their history. You know, by giving them the opportunity to tell the story, to tell their history in their own voice, rather than having someone else write about them. Especially if, if it's going to be written about 30 years later, there's going to be very little accuracy to it if, if, if the information is not preserved. So. That's why I think oral history has, can play a very significant role in, in, in such societies like Afghanistan that's emerging out of conflict. Um, and with, with that realization in mind, um, I, I went home this summer to try, to try to carry a little oral history project of my own um, uh, by interviewing, by going back to the same school that, that I went to before coming here, and by interviewing and recording the stories of the people who not only taught under incredibly, incredibly difficult circumstances, which, which you know, I, I, was, I was a witness to. I, most of the teachers for, I, I came here when I was in ninth grade. Before that, the teachers would come to school, but there would be two or three months in a row that they wouldn't get salaries, but they would still come to school, and they would still, you know, attend classes and try to teach. When, when, when you've got bombs and rockets flying over, when, when a lot of, when pretty much 90% of the teachers had side jobs of selling potatoes on the street or, you know, or, you know, um, driving a taxi around in their spare time because the money they were making with e was either not being paid to them or what they were making was not sufficient um, to, to, keep, to keep their family, families going. So, so I went back to the same school and I selected four, four teach, three teachers and the principal that I wanted to sit down and interview and record their, their stories. Now the challenge of, um, of interviewing teachers is twofold. <coughs> One, I mean, there's, I, got, I got trained over the summer, I, I attended the summer institute with Maya Marshall and Ron. Um, where there's a lot of you know preparation work that goes in before sitting down for the interview, you you look up background information on the individual, you read articles written about them, you know you, you you try to try to learn as much as possible before you sit down, so you have good questions, you have good knowledge of the person, so you could you know generate as much detail as possible. But it's difficult with the teachers because there's nothing written about them. How are we going to do that background research if you know if they're just ordinary citizens teachers? Um, that was my first challenge, and so I basically spent the first month just having, you know, a cup of tea with them, and just having a casual conversation to try to get some background detail, nothing official, but some background detail, um, and a sense of their life before I could sit down with them and, and you know, ask them specific questions. Uh, so that was the first challenge. The second challenge is that the teachers are not used to talking about themselves. If you sit down with a politician or a leader, they could go on for five hours talking about themselves. They've done that all their lives. But if, but if you sit down with a teacher, they don't really have much to say. They, they, don't, they don't think of their stories as significant, especially, especially in, in, in a country like Afghanistan where 
ordinary citizen has very little power, very little influence on what happens in the country. So this was my second challenge. How am I going to get these teachers to talk, to share their stories? And, and it, was, it was quite a difficult challenge. That, that now that I listened to my f first hours of interviews, it's like I would throw a question, I would get like a two-word answer, there would be a silence, then I'd have to ask another question. And, and, and for two of the interviews, this is what happened, that I, I had a difficult time the first hour trying to get the person to talk about himself. I would pause the interview, and, 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 and all over again, I will, I will give him the same explanation that I tried before the interview, that, that there, are, there are people who are really interested in your story. That not only they want to they learn about how you lived your life, how you adapted to these difficult conditions, not only they want to learn about it now, but, but this is an opportunity for you, for your story, to, to be included in the future history that's going to be written. So I would repeat, I would give him this speech again, that, that, that I had to, that I had prepared um, as, as part of my, you know, uh, preparatory month that I, that I spent researching. And, and then I would restart the interview and start asking questions again. And, 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 and as, as they got more comfortable and as, as they got, you know, talking, the answers would get longer and longer and much more detailed, much more interesting. So this was, this was with two of the teachers that I had this problem. The other two teachers, one of them was a teacher, one of them was a, was a principal. The teacher was a history teacher. And I had taken a class with him when I was a student at the school. And I really liked his method of teaching uh, because what he would do is he would, he would give us, he would, he would teach us history as if it was a story in very, very simple language. He would just sit at the edge of the table, he would roll up his sleeves, and he would just start talking as if, as if it, was a, it, was a, it was an anecdote, it was a, it was a story. And, 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 and he, would, he would catch our attention that way. Most of the people didn't have textbooks to read about it, and they couldn't, there were no libraries to do research on people. So the classroom, that one hour that you had with the teacher per week, was pretty much your only chance to learn history. And if you don't have a good teacher who can capture your attention, then that opportunity is lost as well. He was, he was amazing at what he did. He would just sit at the edge of a table, he would lecture for like 30 minutes, he would tell us a story, and then you will have two students stand up and repeat the story. That's what you would call, you call it a story. And you would have two people repeat the story. Uh, the next day that he would come in, he would, you know, ask two or three people to, to, to see if we remembered the previous day's lesson. And his, his style of punishment was really interesting too, that that he would, he would have three people stand in front of the classroom. Usually one or two people could, you know, manage an answer and get away with it. And, and he would have that person who managed the answer punish the other two. <laughs> and it was an interesting, it was an interesting style of punishment. He would have, he would have the student who had answered uh, pull two or three strings of hair from, uh, from the temple area of the students who couldn't answer. Until, so we, the rest of the students were just sitting there and watching this happen. And uh, he, a lot of our classmates had beards and they were like older students because, because there was a discrepancy in, in, the, you know, their, in their education system because they couldn't go to school five or six years. So you see this 20-year-old guy standing in front of the classroom who couldn't answer the question. And then you have somebody like me, you know, 13, 12 years old, tiny, um, trying to pull a couple <laughs> strings of hair and try to punish this guy. And, and you see, you know, tears flowing in the eyes of this 20-year-old with a beard. And everybody in the classroom is just watching. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe that's not this, the part of his teaching method that I want to focus in. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 the, but the way he, he told, the way he captured attention was fascinating. And his, his style of dressing was really interesting for me too. That in 2002, when schools restarted, Teachers were required to wear a Western dress, like a suit or a shirt with, you know, jeans or, you know, dress pants. But this guy, you will see a picture from him. He has a huge beard. Um, he's like 60, 65, and he was used to wearing a turban and the traditional clothes. So when he was, when he was required to wear these, this, this Western suit, for the first couple of weeks he resisted it. He would just come in in his turban and his traditional clothes and he would just lecture. He didn't really care about anyone at all. And then, you know, the administrators got more rigid and asked him to do, start wearing, you know, your suit. So he pulled some old suit that he had from 30 years back 
And what he would do is, he would wear the suit on top of his traditional clothes. <laughs> <laughs> because what we get the traditional clothes, you have long shirts, right? So he would not feel the need to, to take off his shirt and wear, you know, like these short dress shirts. What he would do is he would tuck in his long shirt into his western pants. Then he would wear, you know, the jacket on top of it. And he would not take his turban off. So you got this guy wearing a western suit with a traditional turban and a huge beard. But that didn't take that didn't take away at all from you know from how we learn from him and and his style of teaching. So he was one of the people that I pointed out that I wanted to go to um, and ask his story because I knew he had gone through a lot. He was 65 years old, um, and I wanted to get his story. And he will be the first clip that we will see. Um, the second person was the principal. Um, I got really close to him because I went back and I did a couple of community service projects. Um, and, 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 and I really, I mean, I, I can't say I used the fact that I got so close to him, but, but it built a, a comfort between us that I didn't have with the other three teachers, that I had to, I had to establish that comfort with the, the other three, whereas I had, or I had it with the principal. And I guess being a principal is kind of a political role as well. So he was used to talking about himself and I had a much easier time, um, having him speak I think I interviewed him for five to six hours, and during those six hours, I don't think I asked more than 12 or 13 questions. Whereas, whereas, whereas for the other teachers, for a two hour interview, I probably asked like 40, 50 questions. It just, it just shows you know, how comfortable certain people are. Um, and, and comfortable in the sense of you know, their natural skills, but also because of the role that they have in society and how that, that role shapes how comfortable they are uh, in, in talking about themselves. Um, I'll play the first clip. Uh, the first clip is the history teacher. Um, he, he's talking about 1972, turn off the lights. 19, 1972, where, um, where 1972 is when pretty much communism establishes in Afghanistan and the communists, you know, start their government. And he's talking about that period, that transitional period where the republic falls and we have a communist government taking over. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what he has to say about that transitional period and then we'll just have a brief discussion about um, things he says. And, oh. Then the collapse of Madele Sigul Borman, Madele Sigul Borman, the African, the Nuradi Gul Borman, the Ivak Yaki Dota, the Woman, Haki, Pachanio, Harakati, or Shugayo, to Bazian, as of home to Banom Mission, the Mitra of the Gash to Gazo, Bazio, Namatsubat, Nekat, Bomo, Madam Bidim. ما علاقه مندی نداشتم که در جوریان های سیاسی خدا دخیل بسازم حتی بعضی دوست هایی که هم سنتی می بود می آمد شب ها می ششتیم بعضی جرا بحث ها می کرد و رسمه دوت می کرد می افتیم ما ولی همی سیاست ها خوشم نمی کرد بوز داخل وقت برم می گفت می گفت برو که سیاست خوشم نمی کرد یا گابرت میگویم هر کس دیگه یون که پیش شما نگو که کیت نیست بگو آه دوست تا هستم کیت هستم مگم رسمی ما شامل سازمان شدن میتونم مشکل دیخونی دارم یا مشکل فامیلی دارم دیخون هستم از بالای مدره کار میکنم کسی را جواب منفی نتی که باید به حیات خاتم ادامه میشه دوست های بسیار خواستم بازی دو سیر را مره نگم و دیگه که حکومت زمان پرکی چند وقتش که بزشت هر روزی که از خواب میخیستیم تا صبح ششونیم شش وجه پشایی بخوریم و به طرف مکتب بریم تا مکتب در سای کپیس ها پروان سراغ ترور پنج شش ده تا معلومه میشوندیم فلان جای معلومه دادن، فلان جای معلومه دادن، فلان جای معلومه دادن، فلان جای معلومه دادن یکی از روزهایی که بسیار 
برای ما خسته کنیم کسی قدیر نام داشت قدیر خون بشیر و قدیر خون از دو بار و ای یک وقت که تدید کابل رفتیم ای برای خانومش در او وقت مدیر عبده اشره سر نبا تکریم ماشتما باشه ماش دوازده سر و عبده سر به خانوم تکر میگیم گلدو سجده رو میگرم بیا ایگه بین ما چند سال پیش گذشته بود کهی روان هستیم در بایسکل سی بایسکل هستیم در یک قسمت به نام زمین تل میگن زمین جهانیشا مورال مردمان سر بازار خدیده اینی میگه در بایسکل روان هستیم که دو نفر پیشوری ما استاد شد در مومن سنم در زیر خدیفا پیش کفار کشید استاد شدیم استاد شدیم ارگاه گشتیم که ایگاله تو کلی ما رو میکشن بگیم سعی کردیم که هدف یا دیو سر از این قدیر است و میلی سلا را وقتی که سر از این دو خدادن این در قد ما پاد شد پاد شد ما قرخ ما میخواد نگی کردشیم گفت و ده تان تیر میشه یه تان تیر میشه هم خبر که باشه تیر میشه بلاخره نفر ها خسمی چه کده مرکت میکنن که مرگی در جان ما اصابات نکنن بلاخره یک گر رو یاکت سید فلشین گفت سید کدم که یه افتی امو دامش در بغل بوتم اومد در بغل بوتم اومد یک کمه که لبایش لرزید یک قفر دامش آمد ما اونتو در حالی که خودم هم روح در قالب هم نیست یک نظر همون تو سوید پشت پای خود به دهای نایدون متوجه شدیم متوجه شدیم که دیگاه یک نفر دیگاه ما از پشت یک دره خیلی سی نفر همون دیگاه زنی نام که اندر رو رفت ما ایران نمیم بلاخره بگی آمد مرده یزیر بارما قدیم دیگه نفر های بایس که بکی در فامیل یک خبر دادن من مرده یزیر آمد میگه سعی کردم که خانمش در حالی که سرش و پایش بچست ای رسید و خون هم تا از یک قسمت پیشانیش دازنه بشانه در خط خون مرده ایده که تا کردن این خانی میدی که این زبانش یک خون نداشت که این زبانش خون شوالش نداشت و مسانی بسیار دل خراشی برای بابا و اون وقت ما متوجه شدون که این مدره عبدالش در سرد که به این تکه گرفتن دو هر روسی قابل یعنی بوده که ارزشیده داشته که تکر اولش گرفتم که خون مرده شوار خدا بازمان خود پاک کرد در فیو تنگز باید این سپسیفیک فرکتر در قویشن در این 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 Kadir, I didn't know that he was going to tell me about Kadir, but it's it's amazing how he structured the story for us. That 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 he started with a very you know general image of what was happening in the society right at the transition from the republic to to a revolutionary communist period, and then he got specific to individual, and then he went back a few years. to tell us a story about how they had come to Kabul to buy fabric and they had shared a little joke. And, and he did all this without me really asking anything. The only question that I had was a very general question of, just tell me about what things were like when the revolution happened, where were you? And it's, it's amazing how he made these connections. Um, for one reason, because he's used to telling stories, of sitting at the edge of the table and just, and just just used to making connections between historical events and saying it in a way that makes sense to us as a listener. That skill is very, you know, apparent here. Um, but, but the detail that he gives is absolutely incredible too. Just, I mean, the gesture of his hand when he talks about the husband, the, the wife licking the blood. Just few words in that one gesture is incredible. I mean, it, it raises a question about video that we yes. talked about that we talked about uh, in the Summer Institute, that oral history has traditionally been done audio and just transcript. 
Um, but here we see the power of that the image could have as well. That it's true that if it's a good quality audio, you know, the grain of the voice comes through and you kind of get a sense of the emotion, but you don't get that gesture. You don't you don't get the emotions on the on the individual's face. Um, and it's to me all those things put together with the way that he structures his memory is absolutely incredible. Um, I thought I would open it up if you, anyone has any you know, comments about this clip before I move on to show you the second and last clip. So if anyone has any specific comments. I thought his eyes, also his eyes were so sad. And so, so... This is the principal. Um, so, um, he's talking about um, the year 1992 and, and early 90s when, so the previous clip was about the transition from Republic to the Communist regime and tw about 20 years have passed um, between the time that the guy was talking, he's talking about. Um, this is early 90s, um, the Communist regime has just um, fallen, the Soviets have withdrawn from Afghanistan. This is when the civil war happens. So there's a huge vacuum of power. Um, those people who kicked out the communists start an infighting, fighting each other over power. Um, and and, and I, as I said earlier, Kabul absolutely turns into um, a ghost town and, and, and just bloody, bloody city. Um, so he's talking about how that period affected the school and what was going on in the school. <coughs> مکتب تو شد که ماجین سمت غرب به این مکتب سرازیر شد به مکتب های دیگه آمد به این مکتب ماجین درسی منزل از این مکتب شد بلاخره بودن ماجین به مکتب و این کشمکش های داخلی که تو شد به داخل شما کابل خلاصه در مکتب یک فضای بسیار نادرست و ناگوهایی که اصلا او یک زبه تربیتی تربیتی حالا که با اون دفار بیاد میایا و فکر میکنم راستی حالا تو بسیار با اون ناگوهایی بود یاد به این مانو که در تزبای تعلیم تربیتی که او سنفا شاگر با درس میخوان در اتاقش فرده ها زده شد و اتاق و حتی با دو قسمت سی قسمت تقسیم بود در قسمتش یک فامیل از ماجرین بود دالت بسیار قدباری ها زندگی می کرد حتی چوب سوخ اگر یا داشتن یا مثلا تیل و نمک و هرچی که بود اونجا اتاق بود سه دای دو اتاق بود که تندوز آوری نشه تندوز های سه ها رقم می تو روز به تیر می کنند به چهار مردم بود دو با دو آقا آشه با آتش می کنند دیلیس دود بود دیلیس گرد بود خواب بود هر گفی که تو شایسته به یک دیلوی تعلیمی در دیلیتی نبود به نوع مشکلات یاد داشتن حتی در داخل سنفا چوب پیدا می کنند حتی در داخل سنفا سنگ های کلام بود که تمام یا پا نداشتن وسایلی که چوب پیدا کنند یا چوب پیدا میکنند سنفا زمانی که ماجیدین دیو باشه دیگه مکتب در کچه شاکت بخونه در کل اتاقا ماجیدین بود اتا گفتون که در هر اتاق دو فامیل سه فامیل ماجیدین بود خوب ما باید داریم که یکی از مادرها بود این مادر مادر پیچه صفیه کوسه فامیلشان دیگه آمد دیگه پرکم مادر مادر داغدیده بود از ما برخودش مالون میشد هر روزی که ما میبدیم و میدیدیم که حتی دروازه های مکتب شکل سریق میشد کلکین های سنفا شکل سریق میشد دی گفت واقعا ما متاثر شده اخون میشدیم و در آخرا بنا با این فکر ما داشتیم ما در وقت ما اون مرکب بودیم بازمه که این مادر تفاهم داریم که اون که دو روز اول ما این تحول داشتیم که مرکب مال مشترک همه ما این بارد تا خاطر فاضل نگاه داری از یا ما توجه بکنیم دیگه اینجوره میشه که هر روز ما بیم که این 
سن پدیدگی باشه و روز ما به دروازه این پدیدگی باشه و بالاخره خیلات شما بار که بار بریم مکتب تا و بعد بزرد به شهری احساساتی میشود در تا رهبرهای جوادی را بود بودین و کلامدین و همسارش باشه این دو میزرد نجیب دو میزرد سر و صدا اینی میده آمده بالاخره باز راستی بنابرای مشکلاتی که ما در این مکتب تعما کردیم این مکتب جور شد ما جگر برای مادر خوب کردیم بالاخره ما که دیدیم یا پایی که اگر تون تر آمد و زشتر آمد بیره گفتیم که مکتب خوب بار ما مزید آمد ما اجازه بتون نزیدیم که این جمعی برانیم ما هم در یک داریم سر از صحب بار باید نکنیم اگر میکنیم باز ما ما یه گفتم یعنی تا یه اندازه گفتم که او مادر زنا خو قابل قدر و قابل عدیس که ما باید اعترام و حرمت در خصوص به تا که به چیز فیلسی یعنی بزرگ چارسی ما کوشش میکنیم که همون پرکلی باشه که یا تو نفس شو و نگاشه و اگر با توی تو میگوی که دزوردار نمیشه زی کرکیم دروازه در فکری چی که به زنا که از بغل نمیتن Clearly, wrestling people down is a, is a theme that keeps coming up. Uh, not only did the students wrestle teachers down, <laughs> principals, the administrators were using it as a method too. Um, uh, I think uh, Nehmat probably recognizes the, the dialect that he speaks in, and he's not, he's not talking. He has a very colloquial, very you know, street slang that he's talking about, uh, that he's talking in. Um, and and that, that, that's really, uh, that really represents his, his, his style of leadership and management too, that, that he, doesn't, he doesn't go to management books or he doesn't, he just, he just tries to shape his style to the needs of the students and the kind of students that he's leading. Um, and it's, this is an interesting story for me too because for a couple of years I went to the same school where half of the school was literally divided just the way he's talking about. That, that families were living in the classrooms. You had, they had, I said the classrooms didn't have windows and you know doors. They had cloths and curtains covering um, and to, to try to you know uh, keep away the cold in the winter. And, and they actually had ovens and they had heaters, like wood heaters and s wood stoves inside, um, inside the classrooms. That's how they warmed up. Basically, the school was turned into, you know, like a refugee camp. Um, and and, and, and he, he does an amazing job just describing. He, he goes on and lists and lists and lists all these things, you know. Like you, you feel like he's about to stop and then another thing comes to him. And he goes, oh, and they brought in huge rocks to chop wood. And then he stops. And then he goes, oh, they started fires in the classrooms. Clearly, um, he has a lot in his heart uh, that, that, he wants to, that he wants to just unload and, and share with people. Um, this is pretty much what I had... Um, the two clips that I showed, um, um, I haven't really gotten to edit um, the other the other interviews that I've done yet. Um, um, this is pretty much it's it's a little difficult doing the subtitles and translating um, the way they speak to, to to try to keep you know the 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 nature of how they're saying it, their the originality of it, but also make it make it you know so it makes sense in English. Um, Elizabeth was helping me a lot try to try to capture that um, because sometimes I, I, I would literally translate word to word and then it wouldn't make sense in English. But I still really wanted to keep that original nature of it because the, the way they speak, the way they share their stories is as important as the stories themselves. Um, so if you guys have any comments, Thank any... Thank you very much.